Welcome to Inside Analog Photography Radio Program. I'm your host, Scott Shepard, and of course, the Inside Analog Photography Radio Program is all about traditional process photography. We talk about instant photography. We talk about black and white. We talk about color film. We talk about dry plate, wet plate, you name it, alternate printing processes, everything going on in analog photography. And of course, the Inside Analog Photography Radio Program is brought to you by Fujifilm over at www.fujifilmusa.com forward slash professional. They have beautiful C41 color neg, black and white, color chrome, and of course, instant. Instant film rocks. These guys have so much great things going on right now with instant film. Of course, they have the pack film in three and a quarter by four and a quarter and four by five. Color, black and white, high speed black and white, but you know what's even cooler? They have the Instex cameras and film. The Instex Wide is in the country, available everywhere. And of course, right now, brand new, the Instex Mini is now in the U.S. They have cameras. They have film. This Instex Mini is two and a half by three and a half. It's the size of a business card. This is really fun stuff. You got to check it out. www.fujifilmusa.com forward slash professional, making life more colorful. Our friends at Richard Photo Lab, the place to send all your film to get developed, proofs, you name it. They got a great workflow going. www.richardphotolab.com, DR5. For the most unbelievable proprietary process to turn your black and white film into positives, into chrome. You won't believe until you get your film back as a piece of chrome will blow your mind. The dynamic range, the latitude, it's just unbelievable stuff. Definitely check it out. www.dr5.com. Iger Studios. Lenny Iger, the place to have high-resolution scans done. You know, a lot of people now are shooting analog. They're using a high-resolution scan. They're making digital negatives on an inkjet. Or maybe they're going straight to an inkjet output but they're making digital negatives and they're printing contact prints. They're doing all the stuff you need to get a high-resolution scan. They're using an Aztec Premier, 8,000 PPI, adjustable aperture. They can give you scans that are basically grain-free. They can adjust it for every kind of film out there. This is crazy stuff going on with Lenny Iger and the guys at Iger Studios. Check them out, igerstudios.com. And, of course, Upstrap at upstrap-pro.com. The camera strap that will not slide off your shoulder. Our media partners www.apug.org, the Analog Photography User Group, the place on the web for all things analog process. This is a great place to learn, to share information, to get tips and tricks. The community for analog photography, www.apug.org. And, of course, our photographic philanthropy partner, George Eastman House International Museum of Photography and Film, www.geh.org, the place to go to find out about the history of traditional analog photography. These people are keeping this alive. They have over 7,000 cameras in the museum of everything that's ever been made, including the Hasselblads that were shot on the moon. You name it, they have the collection. This is a great way to help support. You can be a member of George Eastman House organization. They have a lot of great things going on, but this is something you can do to help give back to photography, to help keep traditional analog photography alive for generations to come. Definitely check them out, www.geh.org. we got a great show lined up already today. We're going to have with us today Sandy King. Sandy is the king of alternate process printing. He does a lot of beautiful carbon print work. He does a lot of education. And, you know, an all-around cool guy. Sandy, how you doing today? Oh, Scott, thank you. I'm doing pretty good. Nice, warm day here in the Carolinas, and we're just kind of staying inside a bit. It's too hot to get out and do much work. <laughs> It's a little warm today, you're right, but it is beautiful, and I really appreciate Sandy joining us here on Inside Analog Photo. And today we wanted to talk about yourself. We want to know about how you got into photography, what drives you to keep doing what you're doing, and you're doing some really great work and some really cool printing, and there's a lot of stuff going on with Sandy. So let's start off with what got you into photography? What got the bug with Sandy? Well, I was doing some photography way back when I was an undergraduate in college. I never took any formal courses, but was interested, and I had traveled a bit back then, and I did some kind of travel photography with just uh, 35 millimeter slides and that sort of thing. A little black and white printing back then, but not much. I really sort of got more into it after the birth of my daughter, and I wanted to record her as much as I could. So I found out that my father, who had been a soldier in World War II, had a really nice Leica system that he was not using, an old Leica 2D or something like that with a few lenses. So he gave it to me, and I simply started photographing my daughter, and I don't know, it just kind of caught on, and I started photographing other things as well. So the experience grew and just got more exciting for me. And I worked mostly with 35 millimeter and medium format for many years. 
I was still not trained, and my work was not very focused, but it was just kind of a driving obsession for me. And then in the late 70s, I bought a large format camera, a 5x7. And, oh my goodness, from that point on, I really learned how to photograph with that camera because I put it up on a tripod and filmed things. I could see the way that lenses' adjustments and movements would change the image, and it was just a revelation for me. So that's kind of the beginning, Scott, and things have just kind of continued from there. Did you find that moving from 35 and medium format into 4x5 and bigger large format that, like you said, with the technical capabilities of the camera, brought a different light to your photography? Yes, it brought a whole new way of seeing to my photography. I had really never concentrated so much just on an image, on one shot. I mean, when I used the 35 millimeter in the medium format, I would expose three and four rolls of film in a couple of hours. But I never concentrated a lot just on one subject. And so when I started working with the large format camera, it just brought a concentration to my work, and of course, I wanted also, since every sheet of film counted, I wanted to learn to develop it as well as I could. So I also started working a lot with development procedures with his own system. Soon after that, Phil Davis came to Clemson University where I was teaching. I was a Spanish professor, but I had a very good relationship with the visual arts professor, Sam Wong who brought Phil Davis to Clemson to teach BTZS workshops. And so I learned from him that really good close control of black and white processing. So those two things, just the ability to concentrate on one image, to spend a lot of time thinking about it, and then to be able to develop the negative so that it would print really well with my process, brought a lot of focus to my work. And since that time, I've been able to take that kind of focus and really apply it back to medium format. I've been doing quite a bit of medium format in the past several years, and I find that I now work with the medium format in kind of the same way that I worked with large format. So you do find that moving back now and using more medium format that you've slowed down and composed a little better and, and work on metering more than you would if you were just snap shooting? Absolutely. That's definitely my observation. And it's one of the reasons I would encourage anyone to spend some time working with a large format camera. I mean, even if they may think that they won't continue to use it in the future, I think it's just a very good training and practice to teach you how to see. So let's touch off on what you learned here with Beyond the Zone System. And this is a very interesting technique for exposure and development. Tell me how that helped you or changed maybe the way you were doing stuff comparative to like the regular zone system. Well, yes. Around the time that I learned the zone system, I had gone into carbon and carbro printing. And specifically, I was doing three-color carbon printing. So I needed to be able to control the contrast of my separation set. As you know, if you do three-color separations in the camera, where you take three shots or through red, green, and blue filters on three different pieces of film, you have to expose and develop those so that they will have absolutely the same density and the same contrast. And so I was able to take what I learned in the BTZS work with Phil Davis take that into my darkroom and develop those separations. So it, it introduced me to the densitometer and how to use it, and that just led to a whole kind of world of control that I did not previously have. Let's talk about your current gear, what you're using to shoot with, and I guess we can start off with medium format. Do you shoot any 35 at all anymore? Well, I do snapshots. I have a couple of point-and-shoot cameras, and I like to use them to photograph my granddaughters. I have a couple of granddaughters. I spend a lot of time here at the house. And I prefer to photograph them with a film camera than digital because when I take it down to the developer, I get a CD back and I also get the pictures. And I'm kind of sloppy with saving digital files, and I prefer that for this purpose. But mostly everything that I do, which I plan to print and make a carbon print of, is done with either medium format or large format. In the medium format area, my main gear is a Mamiya 7 II body. I have a spare body that I carry along in my suitcase when I travel. And I have three lenses that I carry when I travel with that equipment. I have a 50, 65, 80, and 150. So I find that that camera is just really incredible for the detail that it is capable of. I tend to use it, as I use large format, I put it on a tripod and I use it with a fine grain film, maybe a Fuji Across or T-Max 100. And I use whatever aperture is best for that particular scene, and then I'll let the tripod tell me what shutter speed I can use. So that's what I work with in medium format. I still work a lot with 5x7, 
I have an old 5x7 Nagaoka. I think I purchased it back in 1982 or 83, and it'll probably be the last camera I have. <laughs> and I can't use anything because I just love it. It's very small. It folds up into a little package like 7 inches by 7 inches by 2.5 inches and weighs about 3 pounds. Two film holders weigh more than the camera. And I have a pretty good set of lenses for it. And I have an old Tenba backpack that everything goes in. And it's a remarkably light outfit. Used to backpack with that camera back in the 80s and 90s. I'd sometimes go on hikes in the mountains for six or eight miles in one direction. And uh, I didn't have any problem at all with it bothering me in terms of weight. I've also done a fair amount of work with ultra-large format. I got interested in this somewhere around 1990 or 91. And so I've worked with a 12 by 20 I owned a Can-Am 12 by 20 for a while. And I also have worked in 717 format. And a couple of years ago, I purchased a 20 by 24 camera from Richard Ritter, and I've done a little work with it. I certainly haven't justified the cost of the camera in terms of the number of images that I've made with it, but I still have in my mind a project or two that I want to use with that particular camera. That's definitely ultra-large format. Yes, it's kind of hard to get any larger than 20 by 24. But you'd be surprised, this is a remarkably light camera. I mean, it only weighs maybe 17 or 18 pounds and it has bellows draw of 45 inches or so. So you'd be surprised at what you can do with it. I actually took it out soon after I got it and hiked about two miles into a waterfall up here in South Carolina where I live and made it in and out alive <laughs> without breaking any bones. So, but it's a beast. Richard has a beautiful camera. Yes, it is a beautiful piece of equipment. He does very nice work. His cameras are very practical, and they're kind of like what I call user kind of cameras. You want to take them out and use them. Yeah, and I want a 20 by 24 Polaroid camera, but very difficult to obtain. And expensive to shoot as well. Oh, yeah. I think it's up to $250 in exposure now. Oh, my. That's expensive. Now, let's talk about that real quick before we go on to some other stuff here is this ultra-large format film. People typically find that you can buy box film in 4 by 5 and 8 by 10 But after that, Mm -hmm. it's sort of like you're out in the willies. So let's talk about what you do when it comes to acquisition of film stock and what you're shooting. Yes. Well, over the years, the situation has changed pretty dramatically in terms of what's available. I mean, actually, this ultra-large format film is more available today than it was when I first started working with ultra-large format back in the 90s. Because if people will remember, those large formats completely disappeared for some 30 or 40 years. These big cameras like the Fulmer and Schwing and the Corona were used back in the 1910, 20, maybe 30s to make banquet pictures. And they simply went out of business with those big cameras when it became possible to use a small film and enlarge so that people could see their face. So these cameras just were destroyed or stored somewhere and were not used until maybe in the 1970s. In the 1970s, there was kind of a revival of alternative printing processes And a few artists first, more than photographers, discovered these big panoramic cameras, and they used them to make negatives for platinum and palladium printing. So that kind of started the revival, but there was practically no film available. Everything had to be special ordered. People who used these cameras in the 80s would have to go in with other people and do a special order with Kodak. So you'd have to spend $1,000 a pop just to get enough film for the camera to last you a year or two. Well, nowadays, you can actually get on the phone and order 12 by 20 film from Freestyle and have it delivered within several days. And that's true of a lot of the other formats as well. The situation was even better a few years ago when there were places that were importing the film from Hungary and from other places in Eastern Europe. It's a little bit more difficult to get it today, but it's easier to get that large film today than it was back when I began working with the ultra-large format cameras. Now, do you ever shoot any color at all? No, I don't shoot much color anymore. One of the interesting things about my work is that I shot primarily color transparency film with the 5x7 camera when I first got it and for several years thereafter. And I really got interested in carbon printing because I wanted to make permanent color prints. And I did that for two or three years, but it was not very productive. I mean, I spent all day, every day, every week, and every year trying to print this stuff, and I may have 30 or 40 keeper prints from two or three years of work. So, I mean, it was just a very time-consuming procedure. Now, today, I shoot some color in medium format, but really not so much to print as color, because I like the tonal control that I can get when I take that film and scan it, 
and you're scanning an RGB. And so it's really like when you scan it and then control it in Photoshop, it's like working fine with any kind of filter that you want. You just have tremendous control of the final product that way. But I don't print much color. Interesting. So let's talk about here, Sandy, your printing. You're doing this carbon process, I think, is your main stay of printing these days, correct? That's correct, yes. Let's talk about the carbon process. I'm sure a lot of people aren't familiar with it. You use carbon tissue. There's some interesting things here. I think people are familiar with traditional contact printing, platinum, palladium, where you basically Mm -hmm. put a negative down on your coated emulsion and expose it with light, and you have a contact print. You have a beautiful print, and you can tone it and do all this great stuff. But let's talk about this carbon process that you've mastered here, and you're actually teaching now, and you have a book. Let's talk about this carbon process itself. Sure. Well, it's one of the oldest photographic processes in the history of the media. It actually began somewhere in the 1860s. And the reason that people became interested in this process was because the old prints then had a tendency to fade. So there was some work done, some prizes that were offered to people to find ways to get a more permanent printing method for a print that would not fade. And so various discoveries came about. It was found that if you sensitized a piece of paper that had been soaked with Delton and put dichromate on it and put a little pigment in it and then exposed it to light, it would make a print that was permanent that would not fade. And so people worked on that procedure and came out with a carbon process around 1862 or 65, somewhere in that area. And what a carbon print is, it's basically a print that is made up of pigmented gelatin. In other words, when we think of photographic prints, we think of silver gelatin prints, and that, of course, is made of silver metal, basically. And a platinum print is made of platinum metal, and palladium is palladium metal and so forth. But there's no metal in a carbon print. It's simply gelatin, which is hardened, and a pigment. They have some interesting surface qualities because the image can have a lot of relief. When you look at a carbon print that has relief, the shadows will be raised above the surface of the paper, and the highlights will be sometimes paper base itself. So there's kind of a hill and valley look to carbon prints, and it's really fascinating to look at these prints when the light comes in from the side because it really accentuates that surface relief. The other interesting thing about carbon prints is that they can be any color that you want. I mean, whatever color you want, you use that pigment when you prepare the carbon tissue. So you could have brown tone, blue tone, maroon tone, just any color that you want, or in fact, even full color prints, because carbon was one of the earliest of the color printing processes as well. So the color process would be almost like dye transfer, except it's a different process, but it's done the same way. So you have a red, blue, and green. How's that work out? Yeah, that's exactly the way it works. When you have color carbon, you take your separation negatives and you print them in contact with cyan, magenta, and yellow tissue. In other words, you make the red separation negative to the cyan tissue. You make the green separation negative to the magenta, and you make the blue separation negative to the yellow tissue. So you expose and develop those, and then you combine them. So it's called an assembly process. You combine the three reliefs, which are developed on some sort of uh, clear plastic. In the old days, they used celluloid, which they waxed. In the later days of carbon carbon photography, they used uh, vinyls, which sometimes did not require waxing. Today, the people who work this process use mylar, which they prepare in some way so that it receives all of the highlight in development. One of the best color carbon printers in the world is Todd Gangler, who has a studio called Art and Soul in Seattle, Washington. And his work is just incredible. He spent a huge amount of time learning to control the craft, and you can see it when you look at his work. But it's basically similar in concept to dye transfer in that it is an assembly process, whereby you put release of cyan, magenta, and yellow on top of one another, and they dry, and then you separate them out, and you get the final full color print. Wow. I mean, even to start with the black and white process and up, I'd be able to have to do this three times and hold the registration must be a bit of a trick. Yes, it's pretty much overwhelming, and it takes up a huge amount of time. As I say, when I first started carbon photography, this is what I was interested in doing, and I spent two or three years doing it and didn't come up with a lot of really great work from the period. But it was much more difficult to do this back then because we only had analog methods of making the separations. If I were to restart it today with computer separations and such, I think it would be a lot easier to do. Although just the actual making of the prints takes a lot of time. I mean, because you've got these dry periods and wet periods where you have to wait for something to dry. It's 
but it takes two or three days just to make one of those prints. That's why they're rare. You don't find many of them around. And generally, to have one made is almost prohibitively expensive to do because very few people are going to pay the kind of money that would be required to make it profitable. As a matter of fact, there have been several efforts to make color carbon a viable working procedure in the last 20 years, but virtually all of them have basically failed. And the reason is it's just too expensive. I mean, your first 16 by 20 print would cost six or seven or eight hundred dollars. So the only people who would be interested in paying that kind of money would be an artist who could then sell them for four or five thousand dollars. And so that market is kind of small. Todd Gainer does some additions. I noticed that he has an edition of Frida Kahlo work made by a photographer named Nicholas Murai. He was Hungarian who was living in New York when Frida was there. And they actually had a love affair, and he took a lot of photos of her. And the daughter, I believe it is, of Nicholas Murai had Todd Ginger print several editions of different photos of Frida that Nicholas Murai did. And I was looking at a site the other day, and those are priced at six or seven or eight thousand dollars each. So if you can sell those, you can make a buck. <laughs> sure, it doesn't matter what it costs if you can sell them for that deal. Yeah, you can afford to spend two or three nights working. Yeah, let's go away from the color here, even though it's a really cool concept and it works great. For, I think, the normal person that wants to try this carbon process, let's sort of go through the procedure on how you do this. Sure. Well, I do have a pretty good article out at the Alternative Photography site on working carbon. So people may want to go there and have a look at it. But the procedure is that you start with the carbon tissue. And it's kind of a misnomer because it's not tissue at all. It's a piece of support that has been coated with pigmented gelatin. And it's fairly thick coating of gelatin. When I make it myself, the wet height of it may be as much as a millimeter. Of course, it dries down, but it still has a fairly significant thickness. So that's your starting point. And as I say, that could be any color that you want. I mean, I tend to work mostly in warm brown-black color. So I make my tissue by mixing in black carbon ink with a bit of umber. So I get that particular color. So you start with that. This can also be purchased now from Bostick & Sullivan. They coat the carbon tissue there. It's available in several different colors. So you don't have to make it any longer, but I've done it for so long that I prefer to work that way. Yeah, I've got a lot of control over the process at this time in my life, so I still make all of my own carbon tissue. So you take that piece of tissue, and then you must have a negative, and it needs to be the same size as the final print that you want to make because it's going to be a contact printing process. The negative can be an in-camera negative. Many of us today are working with digital negatives. I scan a lot of my negatives and I print them on an Epson 3800 printer using the OHP pictorial. Once you have your negative that you want to print, you sensitize the carbon tissue. And for that, we use a dichromate solution. It's generally a fairly weak dichromate solution, maybe 1 or 2 or 3 percent. And we soak the carbon tissue in that dichromate solution for 2 or 3 minutes. And then we hang it to dry or put it on a drying rack to dry. And once it's soaked in the dichromate, it's light sensitive. The carbon tissue itself, before it's soaked in dichromate, has no sensitivity to light. So you can walk around the room with it or walk outside with it or anything. It's just totally not sensitive to light. But once it's been sensitized with the dichromate, it becomes light sensitive, but only sensitive to UV, to ultraviolet light. So we need to have some kind of device to print some source of light that is very high in UV. People are using plate makers like New York plate makers, and we also use these BL2 banks. Many people use that sort of light source. I have actually both types, and I use them both. They work about equally well. I think you maybe get a little more sharpness from the plate maker because it's more of a point source light. Right. But if they're used with an integrator and with a vacuum, both the BL uh, banks of fluorescence and the point source light work about the same. So you expose that negative to the carbon tissue that has been sensitized. And once that's done, wet that carbon tissue out. You will put it in a tray of cool water, and you made it with a final support, which could be a piece of fixed-out photographic paper, or it could be a sheet of art watercolor paper that you have previously sized with a gelatin sizing. And so you combine the exposed tissue with the paper in water, and you set it aside for about 15 or 20 minutes to dry out a bit. Then you come back and you develop it in warm water at about 105 degrees. And you just drop the sandwich into the tray of water and leave it for a couple of three minutes. And you come back and you can strip off the carbon tissue and the image will be there. It won't be fully developed yet. It'll just be kind of a big molten mass of pigment. But you turn it upside down so that the image faces down 
and it will just dissolve by itself. The gelatin that has not been hardened will dissolve, and it will just float off of the pigment onto the tray, and after about 10, 12 minutes, you've got your image there. And basically, you're through with it. All you have to do is run it through a solution of sodium bisulfite to clear out dichromate that may have been there, and there's your carbon print. You put it aside to dry, and the next day, if you need to do any work on it, you can come back and maybe do touch-up work. For example, you can take two watercolors and apply that to fix up any little issues that may exist. But that's what we call monochrome carbon printing. So it seems to be that it's actually one of the more easier alternative processes. I guess in description <laughs> it sounds easier. I don't think I would go that far, Scott. Most people consider it, and I do myself, to be 10 to 20 times as difficult to master as palladium and platinum printing. Oh, wow. Uh, so it just sounds so easy when you talk about it. It's like, oh, I just do this. <laughs> yes, but do bear in mind that I've been doing this for close to 30 years now. <laughs> so I may make it sound a lot easier than it really is. But it is quite complicated because of the water stages that exist in the process where you have to, the humidity itself plays a lot of role in sensitivity. If it dries, for example, the tissue at 75% humidity, it's going to be a lot more sensitive than if it dries at 40% humidity. So there is just a lot of ways that you can not succeed with carbon printing. But I would say at this point, my success rate with making a carbon print is very good. I probably don't waste more than one out of four or five tissues that I sensitize. Wow, that's pretty good, though. Yes, I'm pleased with that success rate. In the past, it was much slower. What do you think about the ease of entry when it comes to doing carbon printing compared to other processes and, I guess, acquisition of materials to start playing with the stuff? Well, I think today it's much easier than it was when I started because you can buy the tissue itself from Bostick and Sullivan. Making a really good tissue is extremely complicated. And if you buy the tissue from Bostick and Sullivan, you can start with a material that is ready-made, very evenly coated. So then all you have to contend with is getting the right negative and going through a few other steps. And I think in that sense, at that point, it's probably about as easy as platinum or palladium. And the cost is about the same, too. I mean, the materials themselves cost virtually nothing with uh, carbon because you're working with gelatin, which is $10 a pound at most, and pigments, which are very inexpensive. And so the only real cost would be in the paper support that you use. That's when you make your own tissue. If you buy the Bostick and Sullivan material, I think it may run about 3 or $4 a square foot. So you have to kind of take that into account in your pricing. But it's all told a lot less expensive than platinum or palladium and probably less expensive than silver printing today. Wow. Sandy, one thing I think is really interesting, I think analog photography, even though there's some great work going on in the dark room with typical silver gelatin enlargements and so forth, but I think even to keep analog photography alive is people are adopting this hybrid workflow like you're doing. So yeah. you're capturing analog and you're working in a digital environment and you're going back to analog. That's exactly what I do, yes. I think this is really uh, yeah. interesting, and, and let's maybe talk about some choices you've made when it comes to your stock and capture. So are you using a special film base because of your scanning? And then maybe we can talk about your process real quick on how you get it into the digital environment. Then we'll touch on real quick about, you had mentioned that you're using the 3800 Epson and, and the Mitsubishi stock. But let's talk about sort of the acquisition point if you're knowing you're going to work hybrid. Yes. Well, if I'm working in large format, I'm going to use film because I want to process it at home. So I'm always going to use black and white film with large format. But if I'm working with 35 millimeter, I kind of have to make a choice. There's a little trade-off here. You can get finer detail, more sharpness with the fine grain black and white film, say like a Fuji Across or T-Max 100, than you can with an equivalent speed color negative film. That's one part of the trade-off. The other trade-off, though, is that if you use color negative film, for example, when you scan it, you can scan it in RGB, and you have tremendous control of the tonal values in the sub-file manipulation in Photoshop when you convert it to black and white. So those are two areas where I have never come to a absolute decision as to which way is best for me, because it really kind of depends on the scene and the subject. And I carry both color film and black and white film in my medium format kit, and I sort of let the scene determine what I will do. But basically, as I say, film for the same ASA is going to give you greater detail and more sharpness and finer grain, whereas the color is going to give you the ability to come back and control your tonal values later on. I'm always, at this point, thinking about scanning with medium format because I haven't printed analog with medium format in, in 10 or 15 years. So everything is set up to scan. 
Do you find that shooting medium format with your 6x7 Mamiya that you have adequate resolution to make a nice size contact print in carbon? Do you find that you're being held back by the medium format size of the original negative? Or is there enough there when you scan it with a good scan? And I guess we can talk about that real quick too is what are you using for your scanning and how big are you doing to actually make a nice print on the 3800 to be able to make these contact prints? Well, with medium format, the scanner is critical because you need to get all of the resolution out of that film, at least as much of it as you can. So I highly recommend a dedicated film scanner or a drum scanner for scanning medium format film. What I have is a professional dedicated film scanner, one of the first high quality ones that came out in the 90s. It's called a Leaf Scan 45, and it will allow me to scan my medium format negatives at 5,080 DPI. And I get really great results from this. This is not something really that people can buy these days. Well, you can buy them, but it's 15-year-old technology, so people are not that excited about buying a piece of equipment like this. But my system works for me, and I would anticipate that no more work than I do, that I'd be using this for another 5 or 10 years, basically unless I decide to buy a drum scanner, which I think would give me a slight bump in quality. But that's the key, is to be able to use a scanner that will pull as much of the resolution out of the medium format film as possible. If you try to scan medium format with a flatbed Epson scanner, you will not get the quality to be able to print 16 by 20 and larger. Whereas with this particular scanner, I find that I can print up to 30 by 40 from my MIA 7 negatives. Wow. And with grain-free and tremendous detail. In fact, I don't think you would see any difference in quality from my Mamiya 7 up to that size compared to 4x5 film. I know that's kind of a heretical statement, but I mean, the Mamiya lenses are just super sharp. And a negative that's exposed on a tripod in a Mamiya at the optimum aperture, it's just going to have a wealth of detail in there. And if you scan it with the right scanner, it's going to really go great for you. I actually have a print a friend made for me. He made it 44 by 60 inches of an old fig tree that I shot down in Mexico a couple of months ago when I was down there. I made a 12 by 18 carbon print of it, and it was so sharp. He was just, like, blown away with how sharp it was. And he said, well, I'd like to print this for you on a bigger scale. So I thought he was thinking about making a 30 by 40 or a 35 by 45 or something like that. But he brought the print back to the house, and <laughs> it is 44 by 60 inches. Wow. You held it out, and you'd just be amazed at the detail in that print that big. I mean, even when you walk up close to it, you don't have to look at this print from a distance to see the detail. I mean, the closer you get, the more detail that you see in it. The picture was of a tree. It was about 125 or 150 feet away from me, and the veins in the leaves are visible in the print. So it's pretty impressive what you can do with medium format. And the other thing that is good is that today with Photoshop, you can correct a lot of the perspective problems that we used to rely on large format movements to handle. Once you have the image scanned and bring it into Photoshop, you can use perspective controls. You simply select the image and then you use what they call transform and the various things, distort, warp, and so forth that you can use to correct perspective. So I found that to be a very powerful tool for my work. Sandy, what's your thoughts here on people that shun this hybrid process? I mean, that's what I do with all my stuff. Everything's done hybrid. Because you have so many options on output, you can send it back to a lab if you want them to print it. You can do your own stuff. You can make your own negatives. You can just put it online. You can do whatever you want. I think to keep analog alive, people have to get into this concept of a hybrid workflow. Well, that was my thought years ago. I participated a lot, still do, as a matter of fact, on APOG, on the Analog Photographer's Users Forum. And I thought back then when I started using digital negatives that this was a marvelous way of preserving analog in the sense of the capture. But there was a lot of opposition from folks who just really didn't want to talk at all about anything digital. So Sean created a little hybrid forum there on APUG itself. It was kind of hidden away in a closet somewhere where you had to go find it. So definitely we knew we were second-class citizens. But later on, he eliminated that and he set up a hybrid forum that you may have visited. Yep. That's kind of devoted to hybrid photography, whereby maybe we're using film capture. Sometimes people are using digital capture. And we're ending up either with wet processed prints, like my carbon prints, or some people are starting with digital and ending up with platinum palladium prints. So it's just, I think, a vibrant way of working because it takes advantage of all the best of, of all these processes. And I know that in my case, in terms of carbon printing, it's allowed me to be so much more productive than I was 10 years ago. 
because if you're working with in-camera negatives, they're all different. I mean, I don't care how well you meter and expose and then develop. When you bring those back into your darkroom and start printing, well, you're going to have to adjust the contrast and density on every one of them. I mean, there are never two that print exactly the same. And with carbon, as I say, it's time-consuming, just doing one test. That a silver printer can stick that piece of paper under the enlarger, he can make a test in 20 seconds, take it over to the developer, and in a minute and a half, I mean, he's got an idea of what he needs to do to control the density and the contrast. With carbon, I mean, it takes that same step, just doing that one thing, making one test, would take me two or three hours. So I found it to be tremendously useful to be able to standardize the density and the contrast with the digital negative so that when I come into the darkroom, I'm way ahead already with my printing because I know it's going to come out pretty much the way I see it on the monitor. I'm not saying that it'll always come out perfectly. It may be a little darker or a little lighter. The contrast may not be exactly what I expected to see. But it usually is. I mean, I'd say six out of ten first prints are pretty much perfect at this point. And so if all I have to do is make a slight adjustment for the second print, I'll do that. So it's basically made my work. I've become much more productive. I can make a lot more prints these days than I could when I was working with thin camera negatives. And just the type of tonal control that you have working in Photoshop is just wonderful. I mean, it allows me to sort of craft an image to make it look just the way I want it to look. I mean, you can work on parts or the whole or selectively come back in and contrast to certain areas. I mean, you really could never have done that with purely analog printing. I mean, you could approximate some of the controls. The type of control that you have in Photoshop is so well beyond what I ever was able to do on analog printing. Now, you don't want to go too far with this. My philosophy is I don't change the scene. I don't put things in that are not there. I'll clean up the file, take out dust spots. If there's a big hole or something in it, I might clone a part of the sky and put it in there. Or if there's an area of grass where there's a defect, I might do the same thing. But I'm not going to do anything extensive in terms of changing the image because I'm really looking for a 100% photographic look. And I want to maintain the truthfulness of the scene as I saw it. So I don't put flying frogs and pigs in my prints, for example. <laughs> No, but I think you can work hybrid. You can use great analog capture, but then you can use this digital intermediary with Photoshop to be able to adjust, like you said, these issues with tonality and dust spotting, things that you can do on a negative in a dark room, and you can touch things up and you can fix all this stuff. But consequently, I think any more with everything being so complex life-wise and everything else that people are limited with a certain amount of time to be able to work on their craft. Unless you want to stay in the dark room 24-7, I think this is another way to be able to speed things up, make it a little bit easier, and be able to come out with a nice, true photographic print. Yes. Well, I really think it's a tremendous method to control your process. I came to this a little late. In part, it was a deliberate move, or I deliberately avoided it for a while. My good friend Sam Mung that I mentioned earlier, he was doing digital negatives. It was back earlier in the 1980s. I mean, I knew what was going on, but at the time, I mean, I was a department chair at Clemson, and I had 45 people in my department, and I was totally responsible for running the department. So I spent a huge number of hours in front of the computer writing reports, uh, writing evaluations, and I did not want to come home and spend another minute in front of the computer. So I deliberately stayed totally analog until I left that position when I stepped down as chair of the department and went back to just teaching in the classroom. And then I didn't have so much time I'd have to spend at the computer, and I was able to enjoy the time at home learning Photoshop. So as I say, I came to it a little late. Some people still say this is the reason they don't want to do digital, is that they don't want to spend time in front of the computer. And I think that's a valid reason, because it certainly was, in my case, a valid reason why I didn't think it was something I wanted to do. But once you learn it and realize how powerful it is, it becomes such a part of your life that it's hard to imagine going back and working any other way. Well, exactly. And I think anymore, it's a no-brainer. I mean, it's great that people can do traditional, completely analog start to finish, but I don't see there's any reason why not to enjoy this digital technology. Because you get a certain look when you capture analog that you can't get with digital yet. I mean, digital is getting better and better. And if you have forty or $50,000 to spend on a great digital back, well, you can get some amazing stuff. But I think for cost of capture, you still can't beat film. No, I agree completely. And I think medium format film is a tremendous value. And it's also pretty convenient to walk around with a Mamiya 7 and make these negatives that I can print up to 40 by 50. I mean, I really could not even do that with $50,000 medium format back. 
I mean, people do all sorts of tests of this stuff, but in terms of black and white, a piece of 6 by 7 centimeter film, T-Max 100 or across, has a lot more detail in it than anything you can get on the medium format back. I mean, even 60 megapixel backs will not come close to what you could have in a piece of 6 by 7 black and white film. In color, it's a different issue. I think you'd probably have to go to 4 by 5 to equal their expensive medium format digital backs. Because with medium format, it comes a little short. But for black and white, it's a tremendous value. And as I say, I'm not interested so much in color anyway. So I'm very, very pleased with what I can do with medium format and black and white. So, Sandy, let's talk about your book real quick. you got a book out on how to do this process. Even mm-hmm. more so, you teach this to people so they can actually get up to speed a lot quicker than getting frustrated themselves in their own dark room. So let's talk about what you're doing to help people pursue this alternate process, carbon printing, and this great stuff you're doing. Yes. Well, I do have a book, which is sold through the alternative photography site that Malin Fabry runs. And I also have an article on carbon printing that's at that site. And it's also at Buffalo's BlinkingEye.com site. I forget which one went first. I think I had it first at Ed's site, and then I put it at the alternative photography site. But both of those articles are very long, detailed articles that one could actually use to start carbon printing. And people have told me that they have used them from start to scratch and been able to make prints following the directions there. The book is a little more detailed, but I think the article is an excellent starting point for people who want to really kind of see what it's all about. I have detailed instructions in the article and, of course, in the book on making carbon tissue, on sensitizing the tissue, developing it in the warm water, spotting, touching out, and all that stuff. I mean, I try to make this information available for people because I basically want to share and promote carbon printing to the extent that I can. I have taught quite a number of workshops over the past 10 or 12 or 15 years. So I forget when I taught my first one. I think it was maybe 1990 or so. So I've been doing this for maybe 20 years almost. And I teach often at the formulary in the summer. I've taught several carbon workshops there, and I've been invited to teach carbon workshops in Spain and Mexico. I just did one in Mexico, in Jalapa, as part of a international symposium on alternative printing. I met down there John Goodman, who some of you know is one of the premier photogravure workers in the world. It's interesting because we share a lot of interest in terms of the process because photogravure begins with what is essentially a carbon tissue. So we have a lot to talk about in terms of those procedures. And I also had an exhibition down there of my work. I had, I think, some 25 carbon prints on display at a gallery. I've also had an exhibition and workshop in Istanbul, Turkey, three years ago. And we went to China. They invited us to do my friend Sam and Wang China, and we did workshop for some of the students at the Fine Art Institute in Nanjing, China. I have a really nice certificate from there, L in Chinese, you know, thanking me for the workshop. And I do workshops at home also. I do one-on-one workshops with people, usually for a couple of days. I think you get a lot out of a couple of days and to kind of maximize the experience. They're very efficient in my home because I know where everything is, and if I reach out, I know where the beaker is, and so I don't have any waste time getting started. As soon as the person walks into the house, we start working, and I work with them pretty much for a couple of days as much as they want to work. I mean, some people leave at 6 and they go back to their motel, and others have been in my house until 1 or 2 in the morning printing. So, but it's up to them, however much they want to work. I try to give the people who do my workshops a good experience as they can possibly get and to share everything that I can with them. I teach everything that I know. I don't hold any secrets back. I try to tell them everything that I have learned in 25 years of working in carbon, and I don't have anything that I keep from them. So for me, that's a lot of fun. I love going out to Montana. It's a great experience. I also taught a workshop with Bill Schwab, his photo shop in Michigan. It was the first time I'd been out to that area of the country, and it was a lot of fun driving up there. I'm kind of amazed we think of ourselves living in South Carolina as far away away from anything in the north. But I was able to drive up there in one day. I think it's 13 hours of driving, but I can go from South Carolina almost to Canada in a day. It's not too bad. It kind of gives you a sense of power that you can actually do that in this country. Sure. But going out to Montana is another deal. I mean, if I drive out there, that's a three- (laughs) or four-day experience. What do you think the best way for someone to get started doing carbon prints? I mean, of course, your book is going to outline this process, I think, pretty detailed. And let's talk about some of the classes that are coming up here. Do you have anything scheduled where people can actually do a special class with you one-on-one or any kind of group sessions you're working on? I have two one-on-one sessions scheduled. I have one scheduled for the first week in September, and then I have another one that's scheduled sometimes out in October. We don't have any arrangements on that. 
At this point, I'm fairly certain that we will schedule to do a carbon workshop next year at the Photographer's Formulary in Condon, Montana. And I don't have anything other than that in terms of group activities at this point. I have spoken with Michael Smith, the ASO printer, and he's completing a big building. And we've talked about me coming up there and doing carbon workshops. And I'm interested in doing that because I think in that particular location with the urban centers around New York and Philly and so forth, it'd be a good place to draw some people. I've considered setting up more workshops here, but it's not easy to get to my place, and there's not major centers of population around. So I think it'd be nice if Michael gets that place finished. I'd maybe try to run a couple of workshops there a year and see how it comes out. That's not been set up yet. Again, he's not even finished with that building yet, but it's on the burner for something to do in the future. So out of all the stuff that you've done photographically, what haven't you got to do yet that you're really looking forward to? Well, I like to travel, and I want to travel more in China and do more work there. I can't think of anything that I have not really experienced that I want to experience in terms of processes, because I experiment a lot. I mean, I try out all different kinds. I've printed with platinum, palladium, with Van Dyke, all these different alternative processes. I would perhaps want to go back and do some three-color carbon photography again using the current computer technology. And as a matter of fact, I have, and I'm looking at this thing right now, I have a one-shot 5 by 7 color camera from the 1940s or 1950s. I don't know if you know what this is, but in the studios back in the 30s, 40s, and 50s, they would expose three sheets of film in one camera. On the camera, it has holders for your red, green, and blue negatives. Right. And it has helical mirrors inside that split the light and send part of it straight through, and then part of it is diverted through a different holder that has a different filter in front of it. And I've restored this camera, and I'm calibrating it now, aligning it, and I hope to make some color work with it. I mean, when I did this kind of color separation work back in the 80s, I printed carbon, but I didn't have anything really to do except the carbon. Nowadays, you can actually, in Photoshop, you can bind these red, green, and blue negatives after you scan them, and they make beautiful color. There was a thread not so long ago on the large format forum of people who were doing this. And when I read about it, I went back and I pulled out some, maybe I have 80 or 90 separation sets that I made back in the early 80s when I was working on color carbon. And of course, I never got around to printing any of them. I mean, because it takes you a month to make one print and you've got 80 separation sets where you figure it out right away. You're four or five years out. But I went back and I scanned a few of those and I combined them in Photoshop, merged them with the right channels. And the color was just fantastic, really incredibly beautiful color. And then I compared what I was getting with some of the work that I had done with color negative film and color transparency film back in that period. And the black and white true separations were just giving me much, much better control and color fidelity, less grain, and everything than the color negative and transparency materials. So I'm hoping to do a little of this in the next year or so. I'm going to say I've got the camera. I've got the lens, I've got it all set up, I've spent a little money having it restored because I had to put in a couple of new palical mirrors, but at this point I have everything in hand to work with it, and so I'm kind of excited about that as an upcoming project. It's really interesting when you see these three color separation photographs and you actually lay the layers together. It makes yes. beautiful color, beautiful prints. I think the original Kodachrome back from like the 19-teens that Kodak actually called Kodachrome before they had the current or what people really think of Kodachrome was, mm -hmm. was this three-color process stacked together, make uh -huh. these prints. It's pretty amazing stuff. Yeah, and it's simple, too. It's like anybody can do it because you can just take your view camera and you can designate your film holders as red, green, and blue, and you just get out of color separation filters on. You can do it one at a time that way, and that makes really nice separations because they're going to all be in alignment and they'll all be focused exactly right. In some ways, it's better than the big one-shot camera. But the one-shot camera has the advantage of you do it all at one time, and you do it fairly quickly. So you can actually work with it outside and take a shot and expose it at a reasonable aperture and shutter speed. Right. This is neat stuff. So, Sandy, where do we get more information on what you're up to, your book, the classes? Where's a place where people can go? And I think we should touch on real quick, you just started a brand-new discussion thread member site within the Yahoo group. So let's talk about that and then where they can go look at the rest of your work. Okay, well, I'm glad you mentioned that. I wasn't aware that you knew of that, but I did just start a carbon discussion group at Yahoo. So I do encourage people to go there and if they have questions about carbon printing, and I'm going to be moderating the site. I'll answer any questions. I'll also be adding image galleries there. 
there's a fairly large set of tools that you can work with for files and databases. So I'm going to be putting a lot of my own work there and also other people who have carbon prints can go there. I have a gallery at the alternative photography site that I mentioned earlier where my book is sold and my article is based and you can see a lot of my work there. I don't currently have a personal website, but I'm certainly going to get one in the next five or six months, and I'll put that information at the Yahoo site. But those are the places that you can see my work. I also have some work in ultra-large format site that I just can't remember that right now, but it contains just work that I did with the big cameras, the 12x20 and 717 cameras. Yeah, this is great stuff, and I really appreciate you joining us today and actually giving back to the community here and keeping this photographic process alive and all the work you're doing. It's just great stuff, Sandy. Well, it's an honor talking to you, and I really appreciate the opportunity to let people kind of know what I've been doing and my background and so forth. I think it's not so widely known. Most people think that I taught photography, but that's really not the case at all. My background was academia and Spanish literature. In my research agenda, I've done a lot of publications in Spain on Spanish pictorialism. I don't talk about that very much, but it was something that I did as my research agenda for promotion and that sort of thing at the university. And I'm still doing a bit of it. Just had an invitation from a group in Spain that are publishing a book on a gun bichromate photographer, and they asked me to write an introduction on pictorialism in Spain. Of course, I have a book on that, and I should find it fairly easy to do. It's something that I don't really need to do anymore in terms of my career because I'll get paid a little bit for it, but it won't be something that will serve to advance me anymore in the profession right. <laughs> since I retired from the university in 2006. But that's something I want to do anyway. Now, this is great. We definitely look forward to talking again, maybe getting in more detailed process of some of these topics with carbon printing and just helping people get involved with this great process and just learning more from yourself. And this is really great. And I do really appreciate it, Sandy. Join us, and we're going to talk again here soon. Thank you so much, Scott. Well, there you go, Sandy King. The king of carbon printing, alternate process, you know, and an all-around cool guy. Beautiful photography. You really need to see these carbon prints in person. They're just unbelievable, mind-blowing stuff. And Sandy's a great guy and a really good educator. You definitely want to check out his classes, what he's doing, and just all the great stuff that Sandy's up to. The Inside Analog Photography radio program is brought to you by Fujifilm, making life more colorful over at www.fujifilmusa.com. Our friends at Richard Photo Lab at richardphotolab.com. DR5 over at www.dr5.com. Iger Studios over at igerstudios.com. Upstrap at upstrap-pro.com. And of course, our media partners, APUG, the Analog Photography User Group over at www.apug.org. Our photography philanthropy partners, George Eastman House International Museum of Photography and Film over at www.geh.org. I've been your host, Scott Chipper, here on Inside Analog Photography Radio. We'll be back next week with more great analog photography. 